Yes, yeah. please. Thank you, sir. Yeah, good morning, friends, and uh, good afternoon to Professor Bansal. Good afternoon to Professor Bansal. And indeed, it's a very pleasure for me personally and also to the VAT AP University. And on behalf of the VAT AP University, VAT AP School of Law, we warmly welcome Professor Bansal for this distinguished international guest series. And this particular international guest series is going to discuss very important aspects relating to the international law mechanisms relating to the use of force and the current Russian and Ukraine crisis. So in this backdrop, when I have uh, requested Professor Saul to deliver a lecture and he gladly agreed and readily accepted. And we are really thankful to you, Professor Saul, for this gesture of uh, coming and uh, interacting with our students. So we have started this uh, law school in 2020, there's a VIT AP School of Law, and we have two batch of students, and uh, we are gearing up for the admissions to the third batch. And also this university, it's been there since uh, last 35 years, imparting education in engineering, management, sciences, and humanities. And we have four different campuses in India, and this particular campus is uh, situated in Andhra Pradesh, which is a southern part of India. And we have uh, almost uh, some 45,000 students in this university campus and spread across. Uh, uh, we get students from all over India and also we have students from the uh, abroad, uh, various different countries that they are joining with us. And with this modest beginning, we started law school in 2020 during the pandemic. And this particular time, we could able to get you know, a really good number of uh, students and they are very enthusiastic. We also have uh, PhD programs in law and we are offering, uh, we have eight full-time scholars working on this particular PhD uh, currently. And with that, uh, I will uh, introduce you to our students. My dear students, uh, we have uh, with us uh, Professor Bansol from uh, Sydney Law School, and he's a, one of the finest professors of international law and also practitioner. And Professor Bensol is currently Charles Chair of International Law at University of Sydney and also Associate Fellow of Chatham House. This is a part of the Royal Institute of International Affairs in London, which is a very prestigious institute. He was also Whitlam, fellow of Whitlam and a Fraser Visiting Professor of Australian Studies at Harvard University in 2019. He has published more than 20 books and uh, currently is also working on his book on counterterrorism and uh, in one of the finest writings which he has and it's uh, guiding lots of students, practitioners, judges across the world. And over above 100 refereed articles he have uh, written. And also he has uh, got uh, scholarly presentations and awarded millions of dollars as a research grant from various funding bodies. He is a very, very active researcher and a dynamic teacher. And uh, he appears before international tribunals, national tribunals and the courts to represent the various aspects of international law. And uh, he has a very one thought provoking book on defining terrorism in international law, which uh, I think a lot of subscribers and the, most of the students study. And it is in fact, uh, one of the prescribed book on uh, international students. And he, he also has a commentary on the international covenant on economic, social and cultural rights which was uh, published in 2014. And he was also awarded a, a prestigious merit certificate by the American Society of International Law. And his latest book, the Oxford Handbook on International Law in Asia and Pacific, he just uh, uh, came up and it's a really good contribution for the subject of international law. 
and the Professor Saul has been teaching at uh, Sydney and also he is uh, visiting at uh, Oxford, Harvard and the Hague Academy of International Law in, and also he is uh, visiting in China, India, Nepal, Cambodia and Italy. He is also visiting professor at the Max Planck Institute of International Law and the Raul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and also he has given the lectures at the Cambridge University New York University, London School of Economics, and also he contributed to the UN Audiovisual Library of International Law. So if we keep on undertaking his contribution to the development of international law, it's a very immense, as I said, he's a one of the active researcher of international law, one of the finest scholars of an international law. And I always, uh, um, read his books and uh, his contributions very passionately because it gives a very lucid explanations of various aspects. With this uh, a brief and humble remarks and also introduction, I would now welcome Professor Bensol warmly to the VIT AP University and VIT AP School of Law to deliver the lecture. And it's a very privilege to us, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your uh, presence and agreeing to deliver the lecture. Thank you so much. Now it's yours, sir. Thank you. Professor Saul, I think uh, we are not able to hear your audio. There's a some. Yeah, now it's fine, I think. Prof Professor Saul, we are not able to hear you. There is some. Can you hear me, Professor Saul? Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I can't hear you. Yeah, guys, can someone just uh, unmute your videos and can tell us whether you are able to hear or not? No, no audio, sir. No audio, yeah. No, sir. No audio, sir. Thank you. Prof uh, yeah. Uh, Pandya, you have to mute your audio. It's a little disturbance from your side. Thank you. I think you'll be joining in a, uh, maybe in a minute's time. He has some issues with regard to uh, audio is concerned. Dr. Francis, good morning. Good morning, sir. Sorry for this, I think uh, Professor Saul, yeah, is there. Now, Professor Chaka, can you hear me this time? Yes, sir, thank you very yes. much. We could hear you, thank you. Fantastic, okay. Look, I'm sorry, I'm not sure what happened there, um, <laughs> but thanks so much for inviting me and I'm, I'm delighted to be with you. And uh, I remember we met many years ago in Delhi when you were yep. then the, the regional yes, legal advisor. You are right, sir, I see, I see. You're right, uh, thank you. And, and of course, uh, the ICRC, the Red Cross, is playing a, a hugely important role in the current conflict in Ukraine uh, involving Russia. Um, now, you've asked me to, to give a talk about the international law on the use of force issues which apply to that conflict. So I'll focus on those issues. 
Um, but I'm also happy in questions if students are interested to talk also about the international humanitarian law issues which apply. Uh, because um, as you may know, uh, on the one hand, the law on the use of force regulates uh, the initial resort to military force between states, uh, whereas international humanitarian law then deals with the regulation of the conduct of those hostilities once the war gets underway. Uh, and so when we talk about uh, war crimes uh, or violations of the law of war, uh, uh, which you, you will see in the media, particularly by Russia, um, uh, that's international humanitarian law and also international criminal law, because of course, uh, war crimes liability of individuals is an important part uh, of that law as well. So I'm happy to, to talk about that in questions if, if uh, people are interested. Uh, now on the law on the use of force, uh, the starting point of course, is that uh, really since 1928, uh, the use of military force in international relations to settle disputes between countries has been illegal. Uh, so for the first time ever, uh, a, a treaty called the kellogg briand Pact, which most countries uh, then independent in the world signed up to, uh, prohibited resort or, or recourse to force uh, between, uh, between countries. Um, that was then strengthened in 1945 in the United Nations Charter, uh, where these days Article 2, Paragraph 4 of the UN Charter prohibits the use of force uh, in international relations uh, between, uh, between states. Uh, and really there are only two legal exceptions uh, to that very comprehensive rule. Uh, one is self-defence. Uh, so if according to Article 51 of the UN Charter, uh, a state is the victim of an armed attack, then it has a right to use military force in self-defense solely for the purpose of halting and repelling that attack. Uh, and if it's force used in self-defense, uh, that will not be regarded as an illegal use of force under Article 2.4, because self-defense is an excuse or a justification uh, for that use of force. Uh, the other exception is uh, what we call uh, collective security enforcement action taken by the uh, United Nations Security Council under its special powers uh, to maintain or restore international peace and security uh, under chapter, chapter, what we call chapter seven uh, of the United Nations Charter. Uh, and those measures can include uh, non-military ones like sanctions uh, or uh, another good example from the 1990s was the uh, establishment of international criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia uh, and Rwanda. Uh, but also uh, chapter seven uh, allows the Security Council to essentially authorize countries to use military force uh, on its behalf to restore international peace uh, and security. Uh, and that, again, will not be treated as a breach of the prohibition on use of force in Article 2, uh, Paragraph 4. Um, now, there are some more uh, controversial uh, claims about when it might be lawful to use force, military force, uh, in international relations. Um, but I'll, I'll touch on those when I uh, address now uh, what Russia has claimed uh, in relation to its military action, what it calls a special military operation uh, in Ukraine, uh, which commenced uh, just over a, a month ago now. Um, really, of course, uh, Russia's use of force against Ukraine began back in 2014, uh, the year 2014, when, uh, of course, uh, Russia launched its invasion of uh, firstly Crimea, uh, and then the eastern uh, area of Ukraine, known as the Donbass region, uh, which comprises two uh, semi-autonomous areas uh, under uh, Ukraine's uh, governance uh, system. Um, so what has Russia claimed? Well, uh, I think the, the, the first point to note is that although Russia has, ma has, has made many legal claims seeking to justify what it is doing in Ukraine, 
uh, none of those claims stands up to scrutiny under international law. Um, Russia's action in Ukraine uh, is what we call uh, uh, aggression, which is illegal under, uh, uh, inter uh, under customary international law. Uh, it's uh, uh, also a prohibited use of force under Article 2.4, uh, because any use of military force between states comes within that provision. Uh, so the question then is, um, uh, is what Russia is doing justified in self-defense? Uh, or is it justified by some other uh, legal basis uh, which the international community would accept? Uh, so firstly, Russia has claimed to be acting in what we call individual self-defence against uh, what it says is an armed attack by Ukraine upon Russia. Um, now, it's a little hard to understand uh, precisely how this claim is being made because Russia has uh, said a variety of different things, uh, but it, it roughly goes like this. Um, it says uh, the West has been arming Ukraine. So this is prior to the latest invasion. Uh, the West has been providing weapons to Ukraine. Uh, the West has been seeking to uh, enable Ukraine to join NATO, uh, a military alliance, which Russia says is directed against Russia. Uh, President Putin has said Ukraine uh, is uh, seeking supposedly to acquire nuclear weapons, which would be uh, again directed against Russia. Uh, and also that there is a, a, a Nazi or fascist threat uh, in Ukraine, uh, again, threatening, uh, uh, threatening Russia. Um, so if you think about those claims, uh, none of those things is evidence of an actual military armed attack uh, on Russia. Uh, uh, Ukraine has not used, prior to this um, uh, recent uh, attack by Russia, Ukraine has not used any military force uh, on Russian territory or against uh, the Russian military. Um, uh, and so we can rule out uh, self-defense on the basis of uh, Ukraine having launched an armed attack. Um, that's not the end of the story, though, because uh, there is also probably increasing acceptance in international law these days that self-defense is or, or may be available uh, not only where there is an actual use of military force, but where a military attack is imminent. In other words, uh, about to occur, uh, in the uh, uh, very foreseeable future. Uh, it's a credible threat. You, you, you've got good intelligence that that uh, threat will be carried out. Uh, and if not immediately, uh, it's going to occur at least uh, fairly soon. Um, now I say international law may accept self-defense against imminent armed attacks because the question is not well settled under international law. Uh, and indeed, before uh, the terrorist attacks of September 11 uh, in, uh, in 2001, probably most countries did not accept that there was a right of self-defense against an imminent attack. Article 51 of the UN Charter says there's a right of self-defense if an armed attack occurs, not if an armed attack is about to occur, or in other words, is imminent. Uh, nonetheless, post 9-11, uh, uh, more countries seemingly have supported uh, what we might call uh, uh, anticipatory self-defense against an imminent attack, to the point that uh, even some years ago, the United Nations Secretary General seemed to accept uh, that there is a right of uh, uh, anticipatory self-defense against an imminent uh, armed attack. Um, that still is, I would say, controversial. Uh, because there is no clear uh, international case law, for example, from the International Court of Justice, uh, accepting that. There are large groups of states, uh, like the Non-Aligned Movement, which comprises uh, about 120 countries, a clear majority uh, of the international community, uh, has not uh, endorsed uh, anticip anticipatory self-defense uh, against uh, an imminent attack. On the other hand, some states, particularly some powerful Western states, 
plus Israel, uh, 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 Russia, uh, have argued for uh, uh, such a, uh, an expanded right of self-defense. Even if there is a right of anticipatory self-defense, um, again, here on the facts, there is no evidence of any imminent attack about to be launched by Ukraine uh, upon Russia. Uh, there's just zero uh, evidence for that. Russia has not presented uh, any evidence like that. Um, uh, independent sources have not suggested uh, that any such attack uh, is, is, uh, is there. Uh, and of course, it's, uh, I mean, on a common sense approach, utterly implausible. Uh, I mean, why would a much smaller country like Ukraine uh, launch uh, a first strike upon a nuclear armed superpower like Russia? Uh, I mean, it just uh, defies plausibility, particularly given that uh, uh, Ukraine also is um, a, a, a democracy. It's has no record of uh, military expansion into neighboring countries' uh, territory. Uh, so what this means then really is that Russia's self-defense claim is an even broader version of self-defense, which we sometimes call preemptive or preventive self-defense. In other words, there's no armed attack, uh, no armed attack is imminent, but Russia nonetheless perceives there to be some uh, speculative, far off, more distant threat posed by Ukraine, which, uh, you know, some way in the future, maybe five, 10, 20 years time, uh, if, you know, Ukraine manages to get uh, a nuclear weapon in that time, if the government turns into a bunch of fascists or Nazis, and then they decide they want to shoot, start shooting at, at Russia, uh, Russia saying that's a threat we need to counter now. So this is a version of what US President uh, George Bush uh, claimed in 2002 in his national security strategy uh, after the events of 9-11, uh, when he said, look, you've got to stretch the traditional concept of imminence uh, beyond attacks which are about to occur uh, to include defensive action against these uh, more distant threats because they're you know, so serious, uh, you, you, just, you just can't wait. Um, now, look, when, when President Bush made that claim, the whole world rejected it. Um, uh, not only the United Nations, but uh, 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 there was really uh, no other state uh, on earth which endorsed uh, that approach. Uh, when that kind of action has been taken on the very rare occasion where it has occurred previously, it's been uh, uh, roundly condemned by the international community. An example is um, uh, in 1981, uh, the, uh, uh, Israel attacked and destroyed uh, a nuclear, a civilian nuclear power plant under construction uh, in Iraq. Um, uh, so uh, this wasn't a, a military nuclear bomb facility. Um, so Israel's logic went something like this. Um, uh, Israel, uh, uh, Iraq is building a civilian nuclear power station. Uh, it could be used to divert civilian nuclear material to a, a, a military weapons program. Uh, that could succeed at some point in the future uh, in constructing a bomb. Uh, that bomb would then be directed against Israel and the government of Iraq would give the order to shoot that at Israel. Uh, now that's such a, a long chain of speculative hypotheticals uh, that the world uh, has simply reject that, rejected it uh, as, a, as a, a lawful reason to use force. Uh, the United Nations Secretary General put it, put it well when he responded to President Bush's uh, claims of that kind uh, back in 2004 when he said, look, uh, if threats like that are so far off uh, and speculative, then by definition, uh, there are non-military means available for addressing those threats. Uh, that could be through the Security Council, it could be through diplomacy, it could be through uh, multilateral fora, it could be through unilateral sanctions, uh, weapons inspectors. I mean, there are all kinds of uh, 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 tools we have available as the international community, uh, short of using military force for dealing with 
uh, threats of uh, threats of that kind. Um, so Russia's claim that uh, it is exercising self-defense to protect Russia uh, is bogus uh, and has no legal merit uh, whatsoever. Uh, Russia's second legal claim, uh, though, uh, is that um, uh, is 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 a, a claim of what we call collective self-defense. So under international law, um, uh, there's a right of uh, self-defense if your own state is attacked, uh, but other states also have a right to use force to defend another country that has been attacked uh, if that other country requests foreign assistance. So a good example is uh, the first Gulf War in 1990, 1991, uh, when Iraq aggressively invaded Kuwait. Kuwait requested other countries to help it. A large coalition of countries uh, uh, went to Kuwait's aid uh, and succeeded in expelling uh, Iraq from uh, Kuwait in that war. Um, that was also an example where the, where the Security Council, by the way, also authorised the use of force to expel uh, Iraq from Kuwait. So there were two good legal reasons uh, for using military force, which meant you weren't uh, violating the Article 2.4 uh, prohibition, which Iraq was violating. Um, now, in this case, uh, what, what Russia is claiming uh, goes like this. Uh, it says um, uh, these, this eastern region of Ukraine, uh, which has comprised the separatist regions uh, of Donetsk and Lugansk, uh, since 2014, um, uh, uh, Russia uh, recently recognised those areas as what Russia calls uh, essentially two independent republics. Uh, in other words, Russia is claiming that those territories are no longer part of the sovereign state uh, of Ukraine, but instead now form two independent countries. Um, it then says uh, that uh, Ukraine's military is using force against those areas to try to recover them uh, for, for Ukraine. Um, uh, and then that therefore constitutes an actual armed attack on those two countries. Uh, and at the request of those countries, uh, Russia is uh, providing military support in collective, in their collective self-defense. Um, uh, so it says this is justified by Article 51 uh, of the United Nations uh, Charter. Uh, now the problem with that, of course, uh, is a, a very, a very basic one. Uh, the right of self-defense is only something enjoyed by states. It's not something enjoyed by groups of people uh, or separatists or even national liberation movements entitled to uh, self-determination and to eventually become a state. Uh, but because they're not yet a state, they don't have a, a right of self-defense. Uh, and the critical problem for Russia uh, is that those uh, supposed independent republics are not states under international law. Uh, under international law, to be a state, uh, you have to have um, uh, a defined territory, which these areas arguably do, uh, a defined population, again, which they, uh, which they do, um, uh, uh, but the, uh, uh, an effective government, which they seemingly uh, may have. Um, uh, but the, the critical problem uh, from an international law standpoint uh, is that uh, these republics really uh, do not have uh, 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 effective independence uh, uh, as entities uh, uh, in international relations uh, because they are uh, essentially dependent on Russia. And Russia has uh, such a, a large uh, degree of control over their very capacity to govern those areas. Russia had troops on the ground even prior to this operation. Russia supplied them with weapons and finance and, uh, and really uh, propped them up uh, uh, so that they could fight this war. Um, really, international law would not recognize these entities as having sufficient sovereign independence 
uh, to uh, uh, be recognised as states. Uh, for the same reason, they don't have a capacity really to enter into uh, uh, international relations like uh, treaty relations, uh, diplomatic relations, trade relations, uh, etc., cetera, um, uh, because they uh, are, are, uh, are, are not uh, treated as uh, separate sovereigns from, uh, from Ukraine. Uh, what that means, of course, is that these are just really separatists or rebels or insurgents uh, rebelling against the sovereign authority of the Ukraine uh, state. Ukraine, as, as any sovereign state uh, has, uh, has a right to use force on its own territory uh, to restore law and order, to suppress uprisings, suppress rebellions, um, uh, and to restore uh, control, uh, its governmental control, uh, over its own territory. Uh, and any Russian intervention on the side of the rebels is itself, uh, I mean, quite apart from being an unlawful use of force, is an unlawful intervention uh, in Ukraine's sovereignty uh, as well. There's no right under international law uh, to intervene in a civil war to help the rebels. Um, in contrast, uh, there is a right to provide support to a government to restore control uh, over its own territory uh, uh, as, as against rebels uh, and insurgents. Um, so a, a related argument, a third argument then, uh, which is, is connected with what I've just said, um, is that Russia has also made a claim uh, that this is a, 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 some sort of case of self-determination, uh, a right of self-determination of these predominantly uh, uh, ethnic uh, and linguistic Russian uh, minorities in, uh, who, who dominate the eastern areas of Ukraine. Um, and the argument goes like this, um, uh, Russian peoples in this area of Ukraine, I mean, Crimea plus the, the eastern uh, uh, areas, uh, have been so oppressed by the Ukraine state um, uh, that uh, somehow this is a denial of self-determination, which gives these people a right to uh, become independent and to separate uh, from uh, uh, the, 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 the state of, uh, of Ukraine. Um, now, there are really two difficulties with this argument. Uh, one is just a, a factual one, um, which is that there just is no evidence of the kind of uh, grave, systematic uh, oppression, violation of rights uh, of Russian, uh, ethnic Russians or Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine, uh, which would attract some kind of self-determination right uh, like that. Um, certainly there have been um, uh, debates and, and some laws in Ukraine uh, and controversy over the extent to which uh, the Russian language should or should not be recognised within the um, uh, Ukrainian uh, legal system. Um, uh, but that is, is nowhere near the threshold of gravity uh, which is ordinarily talked about uh, in debates about uh, self-determination for uh, groups of peoples within uh, an existing independent state. Uh, this is categorically different, for example, uh, from the situation in Kosovo in 1999, where there was widespread violent ethnic cleansing by the Yugoslav uh, government against Kosovo Albanian uh, Muslims uh, as a distinct people within uh, the territory of, uh, of Yugoslavia. Um, so there's really no factual basis for the, for the Russian claim. The second problem is, is just a legal one, uh, which is that um, this kind of self-determination claim is uh, very controversial still in international law. Uh, so when we talk about the right of self-determination, um, uh, what is well established under international law is that it is the right of a colonial people uh, to uh, freely uh, exercise or choose their political future 
including by becoming an independent state and throwing off the shackles of colonial rule. I mean, this is precisely what uh, the process India went through uh, at the end of the, uh, of the, the British uh, era. Um, that's well accepted. That's the basis on which a large number of states uh, was created after the Second World War as colonialism was brought to an end uh, between the 1950s and, for the most part, uh, the, 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 the mid-1980s. Uh, uh, what is controversial, though, is extending the right of self-determination to groups of people within countries which have already achieved independence from colonialism. Um, uh, uh, and uh, that is not uh, universally accepted as part of uh, international law. Probably what, uh, what, what you can say is that there is increasing support uh, for uh, some kind of limited right of more limited right of self-determination for minority groups of certain kinds within existing independent states. Um, but that right does not necessarily carry with it uh, a right to secede, that is to break away uh, from the uh, independent country of which you're a part and to form your own separate state. Uh, in other words, uh, this kind of um, group or minority self-determination within a country uh, means you might be entitled to uh, uh, aut autonomy uh, within an area of the state. Uh, you might be entitled to your own political institutions uh, and a, a large degree of self-rule. You could be entitled to linguistic and cultural uh, uh, rights and control over things like the education curriculum and so forth. Uh, but it doesn't mean you can also declare independence and become an independent country. Um, uh, now, there's emerging support for that. Um, uh, where it gets really controversial um, is whether there's what we call a right, a further right of remedial self-determination uh, in those cases where a group a recognized distinctive cultural, ethnic, uh, linguistic group within a country um, is so oppressed um, uh, and, and uh, is so victim to atrocities by their own government uh, that at some point you reach a threshold where you do gain a right uh, to secede and become an existing independent state. So this is a version uh, of what some have argued in relation to Kosovo, um, uh, because the, 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 the Yugoslav state was engaging in ethnic cleansing, uh, it was really past the point where you could expect Kosovo Albanians simply to keep living happily under Yugoslav rule, even if they had some kind of autonomy, uh, because that was meaningless in practice. Um, they were being so oppressed by the central state um, uh, that the only way they could feasibly live is by becoming uh, independent. Now, that issue was not addressed by the International Court of Justice in the Kosovo advisory opinion uh, for the reason that the, the question asked of the court by the UN General Assembly, uh, which, uh, which requested the opinion, um, uh, concerned the more limited question uh, of uh, what, was, what, what was the legality of a unilateral declaration of independence. Uh, and what the court said on that is that if the Kosovars declare independence, that's neither uh, authorised nor prohibited by international law. Uh, and any consequences that flow from that um, will be addressed by other, other parts of international law. So, for example, uh, we mentioned earlier the law on statehood. Um, if, uh, if the Kosovars do declare independence and they manage to effectively Govern, effectively and independently govern that territory to the exclusion of the Yugoslav state, uh, then good luck to them. You know, at some point they might become a state. But the court said nothing about an entitlement to become a state based on remedial self-determination arising from uh, Yugoslav atrocities, oppression, etc. The, the question was left unanswered. Um, another case you could mention is the Canadian, the Canadian Supreme Court's 
uh, Quebec, uh, which is one where uh, the French speaking minority, uh, a very large minority in Canada, um, uh, living in, in provinces controlled by, by Quebecois French speaking people largely, um, uh, uh, were interested in potentially seceding from Canada and becoming their own independent state. Um, and that is a case where the Canadian Supreme Court did say there could be a right of remedial self-determination uh, in some circumstances. But on these facts, uh, French-speaking Canadians are just not so oppressed, so denied internal political autonomy or cultural rights and so forth. They're just not so, they're just not so oppressed by the Canadian federal government uh, that they would have any factual entitlement uh, to remedial self-determination uh, of that kind. Uh, and therefore, the question of the future status of uh, the province of Quebec is one to be decided by all Canadians uh, uh, who are the whole people entitled to exercise uh, uh, Canadian self-determination uh, as, a, as a whole. Um, so this is on shaky ground uh, legally, uh, and it's, it's absolutely a, 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 an implausible claim factually uh, because there just is not uh, any severe oppression uh, of the kind uh, Russia claims. Okay, a fourth argument I I'd mention uh, is one which is subject to current International Court of Justice proceedings. Um, Russia has claimed it's preventing genocide in Russia, uh, sorry, in, in Ukraine against ethnic uh, Russians. Um, so there are different versions of, uh, of this um, this argument, so it's uh, using military force to prevent genocide. Um, it's a kind of uh, humanitarian intervention using military force uh, like NATO did in Kosovo in 1999 uh, to defend people's lives from uh, grave uh, threats. Uh, and another version of this argument is that it's um, uh, the protection of Russian nationals at lethal risk in Ukraine. Um, and these are, I'd add, arguments Russia also tried to make uh, to justify its military intervention uh, in separatist areas of Georgia uh, back in 2008. Uh, what can we say about, about those arguments? Um, well, firstly, from what we've just said about the whole discussion of, um, uh, of, uh, of uh, remedial self-determination uh, on the facts, there just is no evidence that Ukraine is perpetrating genocide or lethally targeting Russian, uh, 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 ethnic Russians in Ukraine. So even if there were military rights to intervene in a foreign country for those reasons, um, uh, the factual basis is just not here uh, in, in, uh, in Ukraine. Um, secondly, though, legally, like with the self-determination argument, um, all of those supposed reasons for using force uh, are, are just not established or accepted reasons under international law. Uh, so it's widely accepted uh, that even in a, in a, in a really um, morally justifiable case, perhaps like the NATO intervention to stop ethnic cleansing in Kosovo uh, in 1999, um, it's widely regarded uh, that that intervention was illegal because it was not in self-defense. You know, no NATO country had been attacked by Yugoslavia and it was not authorized by the Security Council uh, because Russia, among others, uh, was uh, essentially threatening to veto any collective action uh, by, uh, by the Council. Um, so NATO decided to unilaterally intervene without legal authority um, for, for essentially moral reasons, you know, to, to uh, avert the humanitarian uh, catastrophe. Uh, you may or may not agree with that morally and politically, um, but legally speaking, um, uh, it's very difficult to argue uh, that there is, um, you know, widespread international practice in support of a right of humanitarian intervention. And the same is true of the use of force to protect nationals at risk abroad or to prevent genocide, which is a 
a species of humanitarian intervention, but also, um, I guess, has a different aspect because under the Genocide Convention of 1948, uh, all states have a duty to prevent genocide. So part of the Russian argument here could potentially be um, uh, the duty to prevent genocide uh, includes by using military force where necessary. Now, the Genocide Convention does not say that. The Genocide Convention, of course, is subject to uh, other relevant rules of international law, which, of course, include the prohibition uh, on the use of force, except for in self-defence or if the Security Council uh, uh, authorises it. Um, so uh, the International Court of Justice uh, has uh, issued what we call provisional measures, ordering Russia to cease its military operation until the merits of the case uh, are heard. Uh, and what Ukraine is arguing there is that um, Russia's intervention uh, is an abuse of the provision in the Genocide Convention, uh, which requires states to prevent genocide. Uh, because, um, I mean, quite apart from there being no genocide, uh, Ukraine argues that um, that provision does not authorise the use of force uh, to, uh, to, prevent, uh, to prevent genocide. Um, uh, so these are really um, inflammatory um, uh, justifications being used by Russia, uh, uh, but, but they have no, uh, no plausible legal basis. Um, uh, you, you may well discuss humanitarian intervention uh, in, your, in your international law studies. Uh, of course, India's actions in Bangladesh, uh, East Pakistan, as it was then called in 1971, uh, are sometimes uh, seen as a possible example uh, of, uh, of practice of humanitarian intervention. Um, and it certainly did, India's intervention absolutely did help to uh, prevent the uh, atrocities being perpetrated by uh, the, the then Pakistan government, which was based in West Pakistan, uh, in suppressing the, um, uh, the, the Bengali uh, independence movement there. Um, uh, but uh, India itself largely justified that intervention as self-defence uh, because of the um, uh, uh, spillover military uh, threats to India across across the border, um, but there's a, a debate uh, about that which you you may well well know. Okay, um, finally, then I, I just mentioned um, uh, one other uh, claim being made by Russia, which which resonates uh, in our part of the world as well because it's in a way something that China has been doing in the South China Sea. Uh, and Russia has, has also argued in, in President Putin's um, speech recently um, that Ukraine has historically always been part, uh, a core part of Russia. Um, in other words, um, uh, uh, it was, um, uh, you know, when the, when the Soviet Union was dissolved in 1991, Russia was betrayed by the leaders of the Soviet Union who allowed Ukraine to become uh, independent. Um, the Soviet leaders also, according to Putin's narrative, um, uh, uh, wrongly gave Crimea to Ukraine in 1954, and, and, um, and it was always Russian, and Russia was just taking it back in, in 20, 2014. Um, uh, and uh, although, you know, Ukraine had periods of brief independence, so uh, at the end of the First World War for a few years, uh, before being absorbed by the Soviet Union. Um, really stretching back centuries, there's no difference between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is, is Russia. Um, now, um, I, I, I don't take uh, a position on any of that historical narrative because you, you, you really don't need to uh, from a, an international law standpoint, uh, because international law says uh, regardless of whatever historical grievances uh, you might have about existing territorial boundaries between states, those boundaries uh, must always be respected. Uh, in other words, the stability uh, of existing borders um, is deemed as, a, as, a, as a, an incredibly high value in the international legal system uh, because otherwise, 
if you allow you know, every historical grievance uh, to justify a use of force to change borders, you'd very, very quickly see an escalation of violence in many places around the world. Uh, because even though uh, borders were often drawn unfairly or arbitrarily by, you know, by colonial uh, map, uh, map drawers, um, uh, I mean, think of many of the borders in Africa, which just cut uh, ethnic groups in half uh, and placed them arbitrarily on different sides of, of borders. Uh, all of that is, is, of course, terribly unfair. All of that can sometimes um, itself be a cause of violence if, if not addressed. But the solution to that, international law says, is not to allow force to decide those disputes. Uh, instead, negotiation, peaceful settlement of disputes, territorial adjustments, um, you know, all of those peaceful methods uh, should be the, the, the ways by which those uh, borders are changed or uh, withdrawn or, or redrawn. Um, uh, so for that reason, um, you know, even if Russia's claims are right and factually uh, they're, they're, they're not, um, then uh, it would not be a lawful reason for Russia to use force. Um, this question came up in India. Uh, of course, you, you may know about the controversial case of Goa, Portuguese Goa in 1961, which India essentially did militarily uh, take back from, from the, the, the Portuguese. Um, I, I mean, technically, that probably was uh, a, a violation of uh, Article 2.4 and the, the prohibition on the use of force uh, in international relations to settle that dispute with, with Portugal. On the other hand, uh, there was a lot of sympathy for that at the time because it was such uh, an acute colonial situation in that context of uh, the decolonization period. So like Kosovo, uh, a lot of moral sympathy for it. Uh, even if technically uh, uh, legal problems with, uh, with doing that. Um, okay, so that's Russia's claim uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Uh, Professor Chaka, how much time do I have? Yeah, you may take in a few more minutes, like uh, 10 more minutes, then we can come back to question and answers. Thank you, Professor. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so what I'll do in the remaining time then is um, really deal with how has international law responded to what is an unlawful armed attack and an aggression against, uh, against Ukraine by Russia? Uh, first point, I think uh, there has clearly been a very high level of solidarity uh, internationally and sympathy for Ukraine and a great deal of support using the available legal tools uh, uh, by other countries for uh, Ukraine. Uh, now, some things were not possible. So, of course, to start with the UN Security Council, Russia has a veto power there. So the Security Council could not do anything uh, to stop uh, Russia's uh, aggression. Of course, that's a, 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 a major limitation uh, of the Security Council. Um, the permanent five members all enjoy a veto. They don't have to give reasons for exercising the veto. It's a complete discretion. They don't have to recuse themselves from uh, a, a, a debate on a resolution or vote on a resolution if they themselves are the target of, of the resolution. So it is an extraordinary power permanent members have to shield themselves from the will of the whole rest of the uh, international community. Um, put that in context, though, uh, I, I'd say, and, and of course, it, it does highlight, of course, in an ideal world, the need for Security Council reform. On the other hand, uh, of course, um, there are really practical power politics at play here. Um, you know, even if uh, the Security Council is reformed in the future, for example, to make it more representative, to put uh, you know, uh, India or Japan or South Africa or Brazil uh, onto the council. Uh, I think it's uh, almost certain that those countries themselves would not get a veto power, but more importantly, uh, reform of the council, uh, the, the, the current permanent five would almost certainly uh, uh, never agree 
to give up their own veto power. Uh, I mean, I just think in, in, in the world we've lived in for the last 75 years, since 1945, uh, it's, it's just politically inconceivable um, that those countries uh, would agree uh, to give up the advantage they uh, enjoy. Um, uh, now, when I say put this in context, um, look, uh, of course, this is a major problem in cases like this. Um, on the other hand, it was the price in 1945 of getting the great powers to agree to uh, A, give the Security Council any binding powers at all, because the, its predecessor, uh, the League of Nations Council, had no binding security powers. So it was uh, much more toothless than the Security Council because it could only make recommendations. Um, giving them the veto was also the price of them participating in the United Nations uh, and being uh, part of the Security Council, and therefore being able, but being ha having the power amongst those states who won the war uh, to do things to restore peace and security. Uh, I, I mean, um, uh, the, the resources you need to stop one country invading another, um, you know, you need the great military powers uh, on your side to do that. You know, Australia is not powerful enough. Uh, to stop other countries invading uh, other countries. Uh, you need the United States, uh, you need, uh, in an ideal world, if their politics were different, uh, countries like China and Russia, uh, you need powerful militaries like the, the UK, and of course you need these days a more representative balance of world power, uh, including India, uh, Japan, uh, others. Uh, but this is still an incremental improvement on what came before the United Nations, as hard as it is to, to see that uh, uh, when a case like this uh, uh, demonstrates the, 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 the futility of, of the, the council uh, in particular cases. Um, Russia also can't be removed from the Security Council. There have been some arguments about that, but really um, uh, to, to do that, you need the Security Council itself uh, to make a recommendation to the General Assembly, uh, and of course, uh, Russia could veto uh, that uh, as well. Uh, so secondly, then, that's why we saw a shift, a pivot to the General Assembly, which did in a resolution in recent weeks, uh, gain a, a, a large majority of votes uh, in the world. Uh, I think 141 countries out of 193 uh, condemned uh, the Russian uh, invasion uh, as, uh, as aggression. Uh, so that's pretty, uh, a pretty broad uh, condemnation uh, and uh, sends important signals about the unacceptability uh, of, of Russian behaviour, helps to mobilise political support amongst countries to give support directly to Ukraine uh, or to impose uh, sanctions, for example, uh, on Russia. Uh, so that is a, a positive step. On the other hand, what I would say about that is if you think about that, uh, 141 countries, uh, that still means about a quarter of the world, like 50 countries, uh, did not vote to condemn Russia. Now, from what I said before, um, uh, the prohibition on the use of force is uh, perhaps the most fundamental, or at least one of the most fundamental rules of the post-war post -war international order. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is uh, the, the, the most uh, clear uh, and flagrant breach of that rule imaginable. And yet a quarter of the world is not willing uh, to condemn it as such. Um, so I think that is in some ways a worrying sign um, if you've got a quarter of the world um, not supporting the most basic rule uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in the, the international legal order. It's not just the usual suspect, um, you know, authoritarian regimes who, or, 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 uh, who, who you'd expect uh, not to, to vote for a rule like that. I mean, of course, North Korea was against it. Um, uh, countries which either abstained or were absent from the vote, um, which again is not voting for it, uh, included some really powerful, important democracies. India, a good example, Bangladesh, Pakistan, South Africa. Uh, I mean, these are very significant powers, potential contenders, some of them 
uh, four seats on the Security Council if it were to be reformed, uh, and yet um, they're not condemning uh, aggression. Uh, now, there are political reasons for that, which uh, are, are uh, sometimes, uh, I think, disappointing. I mean, if it's because you buy Russian weapons, you're not willing to condemn Russia. I think that's a, a terrible reason. Um, uh, on the other hand, some states, and I know India has, has mentioned this, uh, say, have said, look, we, um, we want a, a negotiated resolution. We want uh, you know, a, a peaceful resolution through diplomacy and so on. Uh, of course, that's a legitimate method for, for resolving disputes. Um, uh, but you can still do that whilst condemning uh, flagrant aggression against another country. Uh, I mean, if you just say this is about a political negotiation uh, and, you know, Ukraine has to accept whatever political deal Russia is willing to give it, uh, and, you, and you don't say that there are bright red legal lines uh, in the sand which say this is always wrong and illegal, I think that does send a pretty worrying message about um, uh, uh, the consequences of using force. You won't be condemned and you'll get to negotiate how you resolve uh, the dispute that you yourself have unlawfully created. Um, so I don't think that's a, a necessarily a, a, a positive response. Um, thirdly, um, because the Security Council could not impose sanctions as it has power to do under Chapter 7 of the Charter, instead, we've had a, a broad coalition of states imposing sanctions on Russia, uh, various financial uh, sanctions, to a lesser extent, commodities uh, sanctions, uh, travel sanctions, um, targeting um, uh, Russian state entities, you know, like the, the central bank or, or uh, state enterprises, uh, targeting uh, members of the Russian parliament, targeting Russian businesses and oligarchs, um, uh, the, 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 the cutting them off from the international banking system. Uh, I mean, these are steps um, designed to inflict economic pain on Russia uh, in order to hopefully change its uh, behaviour. Uh, now, of course, a limitation of uh, unil what we call unilateral sanctions, that is sanctions imposed just by whichever states that, that want to do that, is that they are inevitably less effective than United Nations Security Council imposed sanctions because Security Council imposed sanctions are universal. Every country must implement them uh, under international law. Um, uh, now, because the council can't do that, we've primar primarily seen sanctions being led by the Western states uh, and some others. Um, that's still pretty effective because Western economies are so powerful uh, and Russia is so integrated into the Western uh, uh, economies uh, that, it hurts them when the West imposes those. But of course, the, the limit is that there are um, safety valves all over the place for, for, for the Russian economy. Um, you know, dealing with China, dealing with India, dealing with other big economies which aren't imposing uh, sanctions or not imposing them to the same uh, extent of severity. Um, the problem then is that uh, it really uh, blunts or dilutes the, uh, the effectiveness of, uh, of sanctions. Uh, of course, at the same time, the West is limiting the effectiveness of sanctions itself out of self-interest. So, you know, Europe relies on Russian oil and gas. Uh, the West relies on critical uh, mineral commodities um, uh, from, from Russia. And we haven't seen sanctions on uh, many of those things. Uh, because the West doesn't want to suffer uh, too much economic pain uh, in order to defend uh, Ukraine. Um, sanctions are, by the way, of course, lawful because um, they are in response to uh, Russia's illegal measures, uh, and sanctions are a, a lawful, what we call, countermeasure uh, in order to bring uh, an, a, a state acting illegally back into compliance with its uh, international obligations not to use force uh, against uh, against Ukraine. Uh, uh, in addition to state-led sanctions, uh, we've also seen a, a kind of global civil society movement. So private businesses, multi multinational corporations, um, 
civil society, social media, tech companies. Uh, I mean, these are all actors who themselves have been terminating their operations in Russia, uh, selling their Russian investments, um, uh, pulling out of, uh, of Russia uh, and adding to the, um, uh, the sanctions uh, led by governments. Uh, so I think that's an interesting feature of this conflict, which we haven't seen much uh, in previous conflicts. Um, is it being effective? Well, yes. Uh, I mean, the Russian economy is being affected. Uh, the stock market has, uh, has uh, uh, and the ruble have devalued. Interest rates have gone up. Inflation is creeping up. Travel has, has been much affected. Uh, businesses um, are, are being uh, affected. Um, they're predicting maybe a 10% contraction of the Russian economy. Uh, so it will go into recession, but it won't go into depression and it won't collapse. Uh, and Russia, of course, has also taken a whole lot of steps uh, to uh, protect itself from the effect of sanctions. So using um, alternate, alternative finance systems from Western ones, diversifying its export markets. Um, I mean, lots of, lots of things Russia is doing to limit uh, the damage of, uh, of sanctions. Um, what I'd also say about sanctions is that, uh, I mean, the other side of this, of course, is that... Um, <laughs> Uh, Professor Sol, uh, your voice is uh, uh, not clear. There is uh, some problem with the voice. Sorry. Uh, we, ca we can't hear you. There is a, you know, uh, the creak sound and then it stopped. Uh, no, we can't hear you anything. Sorry, friends, if uh, there's uh, some technical glitch uh, from the speaker. We will wait for a few minutes. And uh, thank you all for joining in this wonderful lecture. And uh, if you have any questions, I would request you to uh, either you can unmute your videos and ask your question by identifying yourself or you may leave the question in the chat box so that I can put the question to the speaker. Sir, Thank Prof. you. Professor, when is back, sir? Uh, two, the, we will take you know, maybe you know, two more minutes. Okay, can, can you hear me, Benaji? Yes, yeah, yes. Professor okay, Saul, we can hear you. Thank you. So let, let, me, let me conclude then just by saying um, on sanctions, uh, in order to be effective, they have to be very damaging. Uh, but of course, the more damaging they are, the more uh, damage you inflict on innocent Russian civilians who are not themselves responsible for their president's invasion uh, of Ukraine. So there are human rights considerations uh, in relation to sanctions uh, as well. Uh, also, when you have an authoritarian government like Putin's regime, uh, it's not necessarily very responsive uh, to the pain felt by ordinary civilians. Uh, I mean, Saddam Hussein's Iraq survived and prospered for a very long time, despite sanctions having very damaging effects on uh, ordinary uh, uh, Iraqis and their uh, ability to uh, maintain their, their livelihoods and their health. Um, a, a final point I'd just make, um, in addition to sanctions, of course, the West is providing uh, a lot of weapons to Ukraine. Uh, I mean, just yesterday, the Ukraine president addressed the Australian parliament and Australia has, is sending more weapons uh, in addition to the ones uh, it's, uh, it's already sent. Um, that's lawful under international law because it's uh, an exercise of collective self-defense. Um, Western countries and other countries do not want to put their own troops on the battlefield in Ukraine. 
uh, but by providing weapons, um, that is at the request of the Ukraine government and it's justified uh, as collective self-defense indirectly uh, of, uh, of, uh, of Ukraine. Um, and it would be unlawful for any country to provide weapons to Russia uh, to support its uh, illegal uh, invasion. Um, uh, to, one last point, I, I mentioned um, uh, Russia's invasion is what we call aggression. Aggression is uh, a grave, unlawful use of force against another country. Um, so the Russian state bears international legal responsibility for it. But in addition, aggression is a crime under international law for which the leaders of a government who order aggression are also criminally responsible. Um, now, the problem here is that the International Criminal Court, although it does have jurisdiction to investigate war crimes and crimes against humanity in Ukraine, because Ukraine has given it jurisdiction, uh, uh, neither Ukraine nor Russia have agreed to the court's jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. Uh, so those uh, committing war crimes on the battlefield, uh, including their commanders and even including their political leaders who, who order them, could be held responsible for war crimes, uh, but they cannot be prosecuted before the International Court for uh, launching the aggressive war uh, in the first place. Um, some have pro proposed setting up a special aggression tribunal uh, where a bunch of countries could just create a court, uh, which is really what happened at the end of the Second World War, um, the Nuremberg International Military Tribunal and the uh, Tokyo or Far East International Military Tribunal were, were really just created by a bunch of countries creating a court and allowing it to prosecute uh, aggression. Um, some have proposed that that should occur uh, this time around to deal with Putin, uh, the Minister of Defence, Putin's cabinet, those who uh, are most responsible for taking the decision uh, to aggressively invade uh, uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, there are other legal proceedings um, we can discuss in question, uh, questions. Um, uh, I mean, the human, UN Human Rights Council has uh, ordered an inquiry. Um, various European countries have launched war crimes uh, investigations. Um, uh, and at the humanitarian level, of course, lots is going on, a lot's going on there as well. Um, over 10 million people displaced, 4 million of them refugees in other countries. Um, the European Union providing uh, refugee protection on a, on a huge scale. Um, uh, and lots of questions about, you know, why Europe didn't do the same thing for refugees from, for example, Syria uh, or Yemen or Libya uh, or, or uh, other countries which weren't white refugees uh, from, uh, from Europe. I think you might, you might ask the same questions about, um, uh, you know, the international community has mobilised uh, to support Ukraine in a way that we have rarely seen in other situations uh, where there has been uh, really gross uh, aggression or violations of other fundamental rules. Um, uh, and uh, again, uh, I think that reflects um, uh, what the West is most interested in uh, and when it's most interested in exercising uh, its power to uphold international law. Um, uh, I mean, think of cases like um, Morocco's annexation of Western Sahara, uh, the British government's ongoing uh, colonization of the Chagos Islands, which the International Court of Justice said uh, just recently is illegal. Uh, Israel's um, continuing illegal occupation of uh, Palestinian territory. Uh, I mean, there are many examples uh, of gross violations where, uh, where uh, uh, the West does not impose sanctions on, on Britain or Israel or Morocco uh, or doesn't um, uh, condemn them in the General Assembly. 
uh, and doesn't provide weapons to Palestinians to defend themselves against Israel uh, and so forth. Uh, so there is a lot of selectivity and hypocrisy for political and security reasons, uh, which also affect uh, uh, the way in which international law is enforced. Um, uh, if only those cases look more like how uh, enforcement is happening uh, in Ukraine, we'd have a, a much more robust international legal order. Uh, thank you, Professor Chaka, and I'll, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Saul, and uh, it's a wonderful, you have covered uh, extensively the entire subject of uh, international law relating to the use of force, and also aspects relating to the self-determination and the sanctions, and it's a wonderful. And it's really a treat to, to listen to you again, uh, being a student of international law. I'm sure most of our scholars and the students might have enjoyed your lecture. And now uh, we have a time for some questions. That is, uh, we have some questions in the chat box. Now, first I would like to request the uh, question poses. Would you like to ask the question by yourself, identifying yourself and uh, unmuting your videos? You can do so. If not, I can read the questions to our speaker. Anyone, Aditya, Aditya Roy, would you like to ask your question by yourself or should I read? Okay, uh, then let me read the question. Uh, good, morning. Uh, good morning, please go ahead, Aditya. Hello, Aditya, are you there? Hi. Good morning, Professor Saul. Yes, sir, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can, yes. Please go ahead. Good morning, Professor Sol. Uh, my question is, uh, you referred to the fact that the Russian support to the Donbass region is illegal. But had it been a country or an organization supporting Ukraine, Ukraine, that would have been legal, right? Had Ukraine asked for support in self-defense from NATO or some other country, that would have been legal. So my question is, do you think that Indian support to Bangladesh at the war of independence to the regime of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was legal or illegal? Because Pakistan was a state at that point of time. Yeah. Uh, so when I mentioned self-defense in that example in 1971, uh, I meant uh, that India's claim was that it was defending itself from um, uh, the effects or the impacts or threats uh, emanating from East Pakistan. Um, uh, so it wasn't a case of collective self-defense because of course, at that point, um, East Pakistan was not uh, a, a state. Um, it was an internal part uh, of Pakistan as a whole, which as you know, was then West and, and East Pakistan. Uh, I mean, there is some um, question about, about um, the facts in that case. So was, was this, really an exercise of self-defense by, uh, by India, or was it um, a kind of excessive uh, or, or, or unjustified claim of self-defense? So certainly um, there was a lot of spillover of refugees from East Pakistan into, or Bangladesh into, uh, into, into India. India was of course very concerned about the, uh, the instability uh, as a result of the conflict going on. Um, uh, whether there were actual attacks on Indian territory or Indian forces uh, inside India is a uh, is a, a an historical question, um, uh, or was this you know more a kind of imminent uh, anticipatory self defence against an imminent threat? Um, uh, I mean that's also uh, part of the the discussion. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it wasn't a case of, of collective self defence. Uh, it does raise the question, uh, and this was a, um, uh, uh, an issue during the decolonization period, whether self-determination movements themselves have a, a right, not of self-defense against a colonial power, but a, a kind of uh, analogous right to defend themselves against colonial uh, military oppression. So only states have a right of self-defense, uh, but the idea was that because self-determination movements under colonial rule 
are entitled to become states, uh, they therefore should have an entitlement to some kind of uh, analogous defensive military right, uh, like that, uh, that like, like self-defense of states. Uh, and there was quite a bit of support during the, the decolonization period uh, for uh, not for self-determination movements to have a right to use force to liberate themselves from colonial rule. Uh, but if the colonial power denied self-determination forcibly uh, by itself using violence to suppress the self-determination movement, then at that point, um, uh, the self-determination movement, you know, national liberation movements had a right to take up arms uh, to defend themselves against the colonial violence. Uh, and the further argument then was, and other states should or do have a right to provide military support to the liberation movement uh, to defend itself from colonial violence. Uh, look, a lot of that was controversial. The West, of course, opposed it because the West, you know, some of them were still colonial powers at that point. So no surprise, they wouldn't agree uh, to violence being used against, uh, against themselves. Um, but, you know, that's another facet of the, the Bangladesh uh, example. Um, you know, Pakistan was already independent. So this isn't classic colonial self-determination. It's more like remedial self-determination uh, of uh, an identifiable subgroup within an existing independent state, i.e. Bengali speaking predominantly, uh, 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 Bengali speaking um, uh, Pakistanis in, in modern day Bangladesh, um, uh, being culturally, linguistically, etc., uh, separate for a long period uh, from uh, West Pakistan, uh, and then being severely repressed with violence, denied inclusive participatory representation in the institutions of federal government, et cetera. Um, uh, and so in that light, um, uh, is it also a case of remedial secession? And is there a right of foreign states to provide military support in, in situations like that, which would then provide a separate basis for India to argue uh, its intervention was 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 lawful, but again, that was all very uncertain um, at that time, and 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 these days, very much still uh, still is. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Saul. And uh, I will read the next question. That is, sir, what are the key challenges to the operation of the rules and the use of force in contemporary international setting? Uh, yeah, so uh, key challenges, I think, um, uh, well, there are, there are some technical ones and there are some bigger picture ones. Uh, I mean, the, the big picture ones, of course, are, um, are those related to enforcement, right? Um, uh, these aren't new problems. International law, as we've said, is a, is a decentralised international legal order. There's no global police force that can enforce the rules against violators. The best we have is the Security Council, and it can sometimes be paralysed uh, by the, the, the veto power. Um, uh, and we've given examples of how powerful states, West or non-West, can get away with, with uh, aggression or illegally occupying or taking uh, other countries' territories. I mean, think of, you know, what my country did along with the UK and the US in 2003, illegally uh, invading uh, Iraq on the pretext of uh, preventing weapons of mass destruction. You know, we weren't attacked by Iraq. There was no Security Council uh, authorization of our military action there. And we got away with it, you know, complete impunity, uh, no prosecutions, no sanctions, no penalties. We didn't have to pay compensation. We installed a, a friendly government. Um, uh, I mean, uh, you know, it's 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 a it's a it's a very imperfect system. On the other hand, to be more positive about it, um, the the good news is that if you take a long historical view, um, since force was prohibited in international relations, you know, 1928, 1945. Um, uh, interstate uh, war, interstate invasions have actually become incredibly rare. Um, uh, I mean, the fact that there are so few, you know, Iraq 2003, uh, Ukraine now, 
um, uh, some others over the years, um, is in some ways a success story uh, because before 1928, um, interstate invasion happened all the time, like literally uh, every year uh, for hundreds of years prior. Um, uh, whereas you can count on a, on a couple of fingers, hands, the number of interstate invasions uh, in the last almost 80 years. I mean, that's a great success. Now, it's not just because of the UN Charter and the prohibition on the use of force. It's, it's got to do with all kinds of other things like the, you know, the nuclear balance of terror and um, alliance systems and you know, all of the real politics stuff as well. Um, but but the, the, the normative importance of a prohibition on the use of force has also very much shaped uh, behaviour and raised the political and moral price of taking other countries' territories. You know, before 1928, um, you didn't even have to give a reason to take, to, to, to use military force. I mean, it could be in self-defence, but it need not be. Uh, I mean, you could go on religious crusades, you could take territory and plunder it for colonial reasons, you could punish another country because you didn't like something they did to you, like breach a treaty obligation or just did something unfriendly. Um, uh, you could invade for uh, on humanitarian pretexts, uh, for economic reasons. Uh, I mean, there was no end uh, to, the, to, 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 the, to the reasons states used violence uh, as, a, as a tool of statecraft. Um, uh, and as, a, as violence, you know, violence was a tool of, of uh, international relations. Um, so I think that the good news is that although um, the situation in Russia, Ukraine looks bleak from our, our, our current standpoint, uh, the bigger picture is a, is a, is a much more successful one. Uh, when I mentioned, you know, technical challenges to the rules, um, uh, there are things like um, how do the, 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 these rules, which go back over uh, almost a century now, how do these rules cope with things like uh, modern technology, like cyber uh, attacks, operations, et cetera? Um, uh, you know, the, the, the law on the use of force prohibits the use of military force, which presumes a kind of uh, use of kinetic destructive violence, you know, killing people, burning buildings, uh, uh, destroying them uh, to rubble, uh, et cetera. Um, how does that translate to uh, what we know of the destructive capacity of cyber operations? I mean, cyber operations can absolutely have those effects as well. If you can uh, uh, harm people or destroy property through interference in electronic systems, um, but they can also do a great deal of damage by simply destroying intangible data, you know, um, wiping bank records or stock market records or uh, civilian uh, health records or social security information. Um, all of those things can do untold damage to, to countries, um, but, don't, but, but aren't traditional kinetic destructive uh, 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 effects. Um, so there is a, a current debate about uh, how the law on the use of force deals with um, uh, and classifies cyber operations. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, the uh, last question, maybe this one, can a military intervention by a country against China be justified to free the Tibetan state from the Chinese occupation? And also taking into account the assumption of a genocide against the Tibetans. Yeah, so uh, we, we discussed uh, previously how there really is no um, accepted legal right to use force even to prevent genocide. Um, uh, there is a, it's part of the larger debate about humanitarian intervention, uh, you know, flowing on from ethnic cleansing, which is a, you know, a step prior perhaps to genocide uh, in Kosovo in 1999. Certainly, you know, NATO did it, so they thought, uh, and, and the British government argued humanitarian intervention is lawful. Most countries didn't agree. There was then a process um, uh, within the United Nations which resulted in what we call the responsibility to protect doctrine, um, which essentially says all countries have a responsibility to protect their own people. And if they fail to do that, other countries will step in and protect people from 
serious international crimes and so on. But the, 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 the limitation of the R2P or responsibility to protect doctrine is that it still ultimately only permits military intervention on humanitarian grounds if the Security Council authorizes it. So it still has to be a decision taken by the council and therefore one subject to uh, the veto of the great powers. It doesn't authorize unilateral humanitarian intervention like we saw in Kosovo uh, in, uh, in 1999. Um, in terms of um, uh, uh, the other part of your question, uh, Tibet as occupied territory. Um, yeah, so this is, um, uh, a difficult one because of the way that the international community has um, approached the Tibet question. Uh, on one view, Tibet was an independent uh, political entity uh, prior to the Chinese invasion and occupation and annexation. So incorporation, like Russia did to Crimea, um, uh, China has, has, has just annexed Tibet as part of China proper. Uh, they just regarded as a sovereign part of Chinese territory. Um, uh, uh, so China says like Russia, that's because Tibet was always part of China. Tibet says that's just not true. There were, there were links, you know, uh, various links between China and Tibet, but it was never a, a part of China proper um, and therefore should not be part of the, the Chinese state. Uh, now, the West reacted that, to that and the international community reacted to that by uh, essentially accepting the Russian, the, sorry, the Chinese version of events. Uh, so even those states which are concerned about human rights or genocide uh, in, uh, in Tibet, none of them recognise a Tibetan right to be an independent country. None of them accept that uh, Tibet has a right to secede from, uh, from China. Um, uh, so um, uh, that tells you one of two things. It tells you either the world just agrees that China's claim was right, you know, Tibet is part of China uh, uh, and China has a right to it, um, or um, these are politically um, uh, tainted decisions by the international community to appease China, go along with the Chinese claim um, to not stand up for, uh, for, for Tibet in the way that, you know, the world doesn't stand up for Chagos Islands or, or um, uh, uh, the Falkland Islands or, you know, other territories the West has kept uh, controversially uh, according to the self-determination principle under uh, under international law. Um, uh, so uh, it's hard when countries are, um, uh, you know, nuclear armed powers. Uh, I mean, there's a limit to what you can do. Uh, there's a limit to what you'll ever be able to do to the US or Russia or the UK or France or, you know, India for that matter, which has nuclear weapons, Pakistan. Uh, I mean, that, um, uh, that, that, that is a hard limit uh, on what other states are sometimes willing to do to enforce uh, international law um, because of the power that those weapons uh, give those states, you know, an outsized power um, nuclear weapons give, give those states uh, to, to avoid uh, the consequences of, of, of breaking uh, international law. Okay, thank you very much. And I have one more question just come up. That is uh, a last one, perhaps. Uh, Russia keep on saying that uh, we have a special armed action against Ukraine, but does it qualify as an international armed conflict? Yeah, good question. So um, uh, in the old days before the United Nations Charter in 1945, um, it mattered what the states involved called what was happening on the ground. Uh, so for there to be a war, legally speaking, prior to 1945, um, the states involved had to declare subjectively that there existed a state of war. And then various legal consequences flowed from that. Uh, the modern approach post-1945 uh, and in the law of war, post-1949 and the Geneva Conventions, 
uh, is that it is not necessary for the country itself to declare there's a war, to characterise it as a war, to accept that there is a war. So the fact that, that Russia calls it a special military operation and avoids calling it a war or an armed conflict uh, is irrelevant. Uh, what matters is whether the, internet, the objective international legal tests uh, are met uh, for, number one, the use of a prohibited uh, uh, use of force under Article 2.4 of the Charter, and, uh, and therefore whether there's also uh, aggression and armed attack for self-defence. And then when we're talking about um, the conduct of the war once it gets underway, what we, what we call international humanitarian law, uh, of course, there, there is an, uh, what we call international armed conflict, uh, because under the Geneva Conventions, an international armed conflict uh, is simply uh, a use of military force between two states, and that's obviously what we, what we have. That then triggers all the rules of international humanitarian law, uh, many of which we're, we're seeing violated on the ground. You know, um, War crimes include things like deliberate attacks on civilians or civilian objects, uh, indiscriminate attacks on civilians, uh, disproportionate attacks which, uh, where you target a military objective, but in doing so cause excessive civilian casualties, um, uh, inappropriate use of weapons like cluster munitions or, or vacuum bombs in urban areas where you, 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 you can't avoid hitting civilians, um, attacks on specially protected objects like um, hospitals, uh, nuclear power plants, uh, and, uh, and so on, uh, as well as you know, sexual violence, murder, abductions, forced displacement from occupied territory. Uh, I mean, there's a long list of possible violations happening uh, under, under the law of uh, armed conflict uh, under the Geneva Conventions. Right. Thank you so much, Professor Saul. And before winding up, can I ask all the participants to just unmute their videos so that we can have a, a quick uh, group photograph uh, virtually? Thank you very much. Uh, quickly, so that uh, we'll take a group picture and it will be a fantastic one. It's a nice to treasure because we have a very illustrated uh, speaker from uh, across the shores. Please kindly, I would request all of you quickly, whatever the phase, whatever the pose you are, don't worry, kindly. Shivani, Aditya, please unmute your, thank you. Okay, just all of you cheer up and put nice faces and smile on your face so that we can have a good picture. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And uh, now I profusely thank Professor Bensol for taking uh, his precious time. He's working these days on his book. And uh, in spite of his uh, schedule, he gladly agreed to speak with our students and participants uh, at VAT AP School of Law. Sir, on behalf of VAT AP School of Law, VAT AP University, Andhra Pradesh, we thank you wholeheartedly for taking your uh, precious time and speaking with our students. And we are really indebted to you. And uh, in, in fact, it is one of the wonderful sessions which you gave giving that a whole lot of uh, ideas of international law. And I'm sure our students, participants, and uh, they have benefited immensely. And we also look forward to you uh, to host you physically. When you are visiting, when you have some free time to come to India, we will definitely host you to come to our campus. And uh, we have an opportunity to meet physically in the days to come. With this, I once again thank you and thank all the participants for patiently listening to this wonderful lecture given by Professor Bensal. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye, this, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. With this, we will end the session and we will come forward and with one more session in the future. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, all of you. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor Saul. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, all of you.